Here at New Empress we've got a very special interview this time. Um, it's with a man whose job titles include doctor, musician, documentary filmmaker, author, TV presenter and Radio Academy Award winner. He's also appeared in Absolutely Fabulous and Extras and I think he's got something to do with film as well. But we're interested in the author. We're here with Mark Kermode, author of Love Movies, Hate Critics. Mark, you're a critic. Yes. Why do you hate yourself? Well, so the title of the book is Hatchet Job and the subtitle is Love Movies, Hate Critics and it was about what happened to, um, to film criticism. I mean, it's, when I started writing Hatchet Job, it seemed to me, and this was a couple of years ago, that we got to a point in which film criticism wasn't held in particularly high esteem. In America, a lot of people had, um, you know, a lot of great film critics had lost their staff jobs. And there was a kind of move towards what's now known as, you know, democratised, crowd-sourced movie reviewing, like in the age of the internet when anyone can have a blog and then everyone can get their opinion out there. Why do you need professional critics? And so the whole idea of Hatchet Job was that on the one hand, the thing that critics get known for is for doing hatchet jobs on films, and there was this idea that critics don't like movies that real people like. Critics like, you know, snobby films and difficult films and awkward films. They have no understanding of what real people like. And the other thing was that it was about the hatchet job that appeared to me to be being done on film criticism, that some somebody needed to wave the flag for professional film criticism and say, actually, you need professional film critics and there are two reasons for that one of them is obviously I have a vested interest in it you know it's what I am I'm a film critic and I'd very much like to carry on being a film critic please and I can only do that if the job exists and the second thing is I think that in an age in which you know everyone can get their opinion published thanks to the internet which is a great thing you are still going to need to decide who you listen to and I don't mean who you listen to in terms of who tells you what films to see and what films not to see because obviously I don't think that film criticism is there to tell you what movies you should watch. I think it's there to discuss movies and to talk about movies in a way which is informative and hopefully entertaining. And for me, all the best film critics, you know, whether it was Barry Norman on television or Kim Newman in Empire or Roger Ebert in America or, of course, the great Philip French here, who I think is you know, widely regarded as the greatest film critic in the English language, what they would do was they would describe films they'd contextualise them, they'd say, well, if you like this film, you might want to check out this other film, this relates to this, it was made under these circumstances, these are the important texts that surround it, you know, and they'd give you a sort of film history lesson. And then they'd describe the film in a way which was clear and, uh, and even-handed, and then they would offer an opinion on it. And the opinion would always be entirely personal. I mean, opinions are personal, they're not, you know, they're not universal, anyone who pretends they are is fooling themselves. But they do it in a way which was entertaining. So you'd come away from it thinking, well, I liked reading that. It was well written, or I liked watching that on television or listening to it on the radio. And I know something about the film, and I've learned something, and I've engaged in a sort of conversation with the review. Now I'll make up my own mind whether I want to go and see it. That, for me, was what proper, proper criticism was about. There are nowadays many bloggers on the internet who do exactly that because it seems to me that the, the fundamental rules of what constitutes good film criticism haven't changed. But the difference between that and just the kind of white noise, the gaggle of sort of unmediated everybody tweeting everybody is, okay, who, who am I interested in? And for me, I'm interested in people who've done the work, people who've spent years chipping away at the cold face of film, going to see every movie as a matter of course, not just the good but the bad as well, you know, plowing through different genres, just watching everything that gets released. And, and for me, my great idols as film critics, you know, whether it's Nigel Floyd or Alan Jones or Kim Newman, or you know, you know, Anne Bilson, or you know, Leslie Felperin. Or these are writers who do the job properly. These are writers who take the job seriously, and who I would say offer the clearest indication that film criticism, professional film criticism, proper film criticism, is still valid, whether it's in the internet or or on in print. Okay, um, there's quite a somber tone to this book because you were. Talking oh, I'm about... sorry. <laughs> well, to a certain degree, there is because you're talking about film criticism. As, we, as you knew it, slowly, possibly dying out, how do you feel about that? You know, in the age of, you briefly touched on it, in the age of the internet. Well, the interesting thing is that um, when I started writing the book, I felt very negatively about it. I did start writing it as a kind of, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's collapsing all around us. And I mean, seriously, people I knew, people, writers I greatly admire, we're just losing their jobs, left, right and centre. And it continues, incidentally, since I finished writing the book, a couple of people who I've said are completely unassailable have, incidentally, lost their jobs. So, you know, it continues. But what I also discovered writing it was that, 
and many of the prejudices that I had, and I'm quite you know open about this, about what was happening with the change to the internet, actually were completely unjustified. One of the things I was very worried about was anonymity, which I, th I think the key thing with all film criticism is you have to know who's saying this. Okay, what do they know? If somebody says this is the best film I've seen all year, question is fine. What else have you seen this year? If somebody says, um, you know, I think this movie is really super. You go, okay, what other films have you seen? I want to know just just as a frame of reference. Now, in the case of let's say Philip French, because he's a you know a great example. If Philip says this western is really good, you could okay, well that's somebody who's seen pretty much every western that's been released since 1950 and probably you know way back before that. So when he says this is really good. I'm interested. If somebody else says, oh, you know, this horror film's brilliant. Okay, so Insidious 2, scariest film I've ever seen, right? And you've seen Insidious, so fine. So on that, you know, on, on those grounds, maybe we have, we have somewhere to start the conversation. But actually, it turned out that the more I found out about the internet, um, you know, bear in mind I'm somebody who grew up in the age of lick and stick journalism. I started with a typewriter and then I moved to a, you know, a loco script green screen and, you know, the fax machine, the arrival of the fax machine seemed like the arrival of a TARDIS to me. So I have, you know, I'm like vinyl in an age of, uh, uh, of digital, that's, and that's never going to change. But I've, you know, I've come into contact with the work of great writers writing on the internet who have exactly the same values, who believe exactly the same things, whose work I would happily, you know, direct anyone toward, and um, and say, look, these these they have really valid opinions, and they they are without fail people who, uh, firstly, they don't do anonymous journalism, you know, they, they they you know who wrote it and where they came from and all that sort of stuff. Secondly, they they adhere to the same basic rules of the, you know they believe in the, there's a value in embargoes if it allows the pr the press to show you a film in advance but without you you know blowing the lid on it before the movie's opening. Uh, they believe in something other than just sheer snarkiness because snarkiness is great and saleable and eye catching and you know attention grabbing but it's not the whole story. It's much harder to defend a film than it is to knock it down. And believe me, I speak as somebody who's knocked enough films down in my time. <laughs> The older I get, the more I think it's it's a lot harder to stand up for things than it is to you know to to, to to just knock them down. But also, you discover that throughout the history of film criticism, there have been moments when people said it's the end of film criticism. When you know Ebert and Siskel were doing out the movies, it's the end of film criticism. Is it why? Because two people going two thumbs up can't be right. And then years later, when Ebert died, of course everyone said it's the end of film criticism. And you go, no, hang on, you said it was the end of film criticism when he got the job. So there is always that ongoing thing, and it's it, it's very easy to fall into that it wasn't like it in my day. Well, of course, it wasn't like it in my day, but I think there are as many great writers, if not more so, out there nowadays. The great thing about the internet, everyone has access to it. Worst thing about the internet, everyone has access to it, and you're still going to need to sift through and decide what's valid. For me, the role of a professional film critic is to know more than I do. You know, it, and, and that's why I'd go, you know, what does Kim Newman say about this film? Why? Because he's seen everything, you know, really. <laughs> you touched on about online there as well. Recently I saw an article with one of the chief sports writers of The Guardian where he said, we are basically a website now with a paper attached. Uh -huh. Where do you stand on print against online? Well, it's not against. You know, I was in a screening of this uh, Steve Soderbergh film, and then there's a line in it in which somebody says, I've got to go and do my writing, and uh, the Elliot Gould character says, blogging's not writing, it's graffiti with punctuation, right? And the assembled masses laughed. And partly they laughed out of, you know, yeah, right, because we all think that, because we're all in fear of our jobs. But if you write for a newspaper, you're a blogger, right? I mean, I write for The Observer, I have done for several years, and I'm recently I've been very privileged to take over as the chief film critic for the Observer, and you know, which is a big deal for me. And it's online. I mean, you know, you, the minute you write it, actually, before it, often before it hits the newsstands, it's online. Philip French was a blogger because everything he wrote was online. To to imagine that there is some kind of great divide between printed and online is just is nonsense. It, you know, it, it, we are now in a multimedia age. And this stuff exists in many different formats, in the same way that films can be viewed in cinemas, or on a television, or on your mobile phone. And I think people should have the, be given the opportunity to decide which format they want. I mean, I'm all in favour of simultaneous releasing. I think you release a movie, you should simultaneously say, OK, you want to see it in the cinema? Here's a lovely 35mm print. You want to see it um, less and less nowadays. You want to see it at home on your phone? Fine, here's a downloadable file. The only way you'll ever stop piracy is to say, look, we know you're getting this stuff anyway, why don't we try and give it to you legitimately? And then let people choose. So 
I don't think there is a divide between print and online. The fact of the matter is, we live in a multimedia age. There's several magazines that exist in, you know, I mean, you, you've just handed me this, this is a physical magazine, we're doing this, this is going out online, it's all part of the same thing. There is no difference, you know. A good feature about the Phoenix in East Finchley. So. There is a very funny chapter in the book about... There is a very funny chapter. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mark. No, I apologise there. No, there is several Kim, funny chapters. Kim Newman once said, he said, he said, you know, the problem with your books is this. They're basically 300 pages of somebody complaining with cheap <laughs> knob gags thrown in for light relief. And I... Yeah, fair enough. A lot of us are buying it, though. Yeah, well, uh, well hey, and God bless you. <laughs> sorry. Um, there's a chapter in the book where it kind of reads like a Monty Python sketch where you're accosted in the BFI... Oh, by, yeah, yeah. By a gentleman who takes you to task on it, yet he can't remember. And no, the crucial thing is he can remember, and I can't remember. This, the, 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 exa the example of that chapter is, I have always said, you shouldn't say anything about somebody's film unless you can say it to their face. And, you know, and the, the, it's always, well, well, would you say that to somebody's face? And I've always thought, well, I hope, I hope I would. You know, I was accosted at the BAFTAs by Helen Mirren, who demanded that I explain to her what I thought about the Queen. And I, I did, at least I tried. And I often, I'll find myself in an interview situation with somebody about, and I've been rude about their film, and I feel morally obliged to tell them. And I, you know, I interviewed Lars von Trier about melancholia, which I like very much. And I, I had to tell him how much I hated Breaking the Waves. And I said, I hated it. And he said, but did you really hate it? I said, yeah, I, yeah, I really hate it. He said, did you really hate it? And I said, yeah, I really, he said, good. As long as you really hated it. What he didn't want was for me to just moderately disliked it, which he w would have upset him. So I was standing in the, in the, the foyer of BFI South Bank, NFT as it used to be, and, and, um, and this guy just came up to me and he said, have you got something to say to me? And I, I didn't know who he was. And I, I said, uh, I don't know, have I? And he went, he said, well, you should have, because I'm, and then he said his name, and I have never, I didn't recognise his name. And I went, and he went, and I directed, uh, no idea, and he said, I want you to say to my face what you said about my film in print. And I was, and he was right, incidentally, because I've, I've said that you should do this. And I would have happily done so if I could remember what I'd said. But I had no idea. I, I had no idea what I'd said. And so I, I ended up having to say to him, look, I'll happily say to you whatever it was I said, but you have to tell me what it is I said. And of course, he could remember word for word exactly what I'd said. So we in this, and he said, hang on, you want me to tell you what you said about my film so you can say it to my face? And I went, well, yeah, because if that's what you want. And, I, and, and the point I was trying to make through that chapter is he was in the right. He has every right to do that, you know. And... Um, you know, there's a particularly foolish British actor who I laugh at on a regular basis, who spends his entire life telling newspapers that he's going to beat me up, and I bet he wouldn't dare do that to my face. To which the answer is, yeah, it would. I mean, and there's no need to get cross about it. Hey. Does it happen a lot? Obviously, what? we know that there's been a few that have made the press, as you've just said. But does it happen more than uh, than you expect? No, I mean, the general rule is the more successful and talented somebody is, the less they care about criticism. And it has been my experience that the people that get really, really upset by it tend to be talentless dimwits who, you know, who haven't got anything better to do. You know, I mean, I'm, that is the honest truth. Um, there are people who have every right to... I mean, I write a chapter in the book about John Borman, about whose films I've been incredibly rude. Has John Borman ever complained about it? No. Why would he? He's a brilliant filmmaker of international renown. Why would he care what some gobby little kid on the nation's leading sports and schools network thinks about his films? You know, that, that has been my experience, is that... Actually, most people of any you know of any value, you know, rise above it, and and the same is true with, you know, if you if you like a film as well, everyone takes it with a pinch of salt. Somebody, if you say to somebody, you know, your film's a masterpiece, they generally go, thanks, you know, because they know it, because you know everyone knows their own work isn't. So that's been my you know my my, my you know ground rule has always been I think there should be a divide between critics and, and filmmakers I don't think they should socialize together um, generally I think it's probably not not an entirely healthy situation but anyone in, anyone who can't take it on the chin probably needs to be doing something else also another very funny element which I liked the dogs of Wardour Street now 
Obviously, you talk about your friends who are film critics. Yes. Who did you enjoy reading when you were just starting out? Who well, were your people you looked up to? Well, it sounds like I'm, you know, I, I, I'm saying this to, 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 to flatter them, but Kim Newman and Nigel Floyd and Alan Jones, who were the people who I ended up, you know, because when I first came to London, you know, when I was living in Manchester, I was working for City Life magazine, and I, and, and, and I was subbing Nigel's copy because he would send copy out to the regionals. And I was working at City Life, and, I, and so I had been working with his copy for years. And of course, it's beautiful. It was just wonderfully written, and you just look at it and go, oh, it, you know, <laughs> I want to write like that. And then, um, you know, Kim Newman, who I'd been reading in City Limits for years before that, Alan Jones, who at that point was kind of, I mean, still is arguably the, you know, the country's leading fantasy film journalist. I mean, Alan is now more about festivals than, than the writing. But these were people who, you know, I'd read Alan in CFQ, and, and, and these were the people that I looked up to. And then I came to London, and not only did I meet them, but they took me under their wing. And, you know, and it was almost like an apprenticeship. And I loved that about it. I loved that sense of community and that sense of camaraderie and that sense of learning from, from the best. You know, and I was very lucky. I was at Time Out magazine. You know, Jeff Andrew and Brian Case were, were editing copy then. They were both brilliant editors. And I, I do think that the difficult thing now for people writing for the internet is that you, you need an editor. Everyone needs an editor. All the best writing is properly edited. If you just write a blog and put it out there, it hasn't been through, you know, and that's difficult. You know, so how do you make it better? How do you improve? I remember sitting in the Time Out office watching somebody edit my copy and you know like the, okay what are they doing how are they making it better and it is better it is always better i write for the observer now every week every week week in week out um the editors and you know people like carol mcdade and uh, you know and, and 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 jane and sarah donaldson jane ferguson and and uh, you know and, and imogen who, who go through the copy and put all this stuff together believe me by the time it by the time they've been through it, it's infinitely better than it was when it started. So I just want to ask one final question. What do you see as the future then for film criticism? I think the future is pretty much the same as it's always been. And I think the big mistake is to believe at any one time this is the end and now we're into a new era. No, we're not. The, the rules of film criticism are the same. The values of film criticism are the same. Watch as many movies as you can, describe the movie accurately, be honest about your opinions and your responses, don't try and mediate them because you think they'll fit better with the, with the readership, and if you can, possibly be entertaining. If you can do all those things, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it in print, or on the internet, or on the radio, or on television, or shouting it through a megaphone and speakers call it, it doesn't matter. The rules are the same, the medium changes, but the medium is not the message. And if you look back through the history of criticism, there are regular moments in which everyone throws their hands up and says, it's the end of the world as we know it. No, it isn't. The end is tomorrow, basically. And then tomorrow. Even and then tomorrow. You, it's all, I mean, look, I'm 50, right? So believe me, I, I see the end coming a lot faster than many people, you know. I mean, I'm in the point when I can have conversations with people and I can go, I, you know, when I, it was all fields around here when I was a kid, right? And it's a very bad trap to fall into. You look at Philip French, you know, who was filing in his 80s, you know. He still files like somebody who's thrilled by cinema. Thanks to Mark. Mark's book is available bookshops, download, audiobook. So now that that's all out of the way, Mark, can we talk hair products? <laughs> no. <laughs>